Not so very long ago, large parts of our globe were still uncharted. The map makers of the time covered the gaps in their knowledge as best they could. Over bits of ocean that might contain islands, they drew sea monsters or galleons. And over the heart of what was then called the Dark Continent, they put the best excuse they could for the lack of exploration. Here be dragons. One of the last major areas on Earth to be mapped was East and Central Africa, the mysterious and mythical source of the mighty Nile. The animals here presented no great barrier to exploration, despite the warnings. But the map makers had been right about one thing. Here, indeed, there were dragons. The dragons were Nile crocodiles. Two hundred million years ago, the Earth was ruled by dragons. Crocodiles, primitive lizards, and the great dinosaurs were the dominant animal life forms on the planet. What caused the dinosaurs to become extinct is still a matter of conjecture. But what is certain is that the crocodiles survived. In fact, they are enormously successful creatures, found in warm latitudes all the way around the Earth. Like all reptiles, crocodiles are cold-blooded. Their blood is not actually cold. Rather, its temperature fluctuates. To regulate it, the crocs rely on external heat sources. They move in and out of the water and bask in the sun. When they get too hot, they head for the shade or open their mouths for evaporative cooling. If they're still too hot, or if they're disturbed, they slip back into the water. In the water, with its powerful tail and webbed feet, the crocodile is superbly adapted for swimming. Its nostrils, eyes and ears are all arranged just above water level so it can lie in wait for prey with its head barely showing. Perhaps the most spectacular crocs in Africa live here, in a series of pools along a 10-mile stretch of the tiny Grumeti River in Tanzania's Serengeti National Park. They are monsters, one of many distinctions this group enjoys. Like most large reptiles, they can go for long periods without food. But once a year, these crocs are treated to a huge feast. A mere stream most of the time, the Grumeti shrinks to a series of greasy pools in the dry season. But there are dragons here as plentiful and fearful as any in legend. It is early in the dry season. The dominant males have begun courtship. Crocodiles have a fierce appetite for mating, no less than for meat. In fact, this is a submissive posture by which the female indicates her acceptance of her suitor and lets him know she will not attack if he tries to mate.
Mating takes place in shallow water. One month later, the eggs will be laid. As the water level drops, life becomes easier for those smaller predators that share the river with the crocs. The marsh mongoose is a solitary creature. It feeds mainly on crabs and shellfish it finds in the shallows with its nimble and sensitive hands. This one is after mussels, which he will break by throwing against a rock. Failing to break it in the shallows, he carries it to a favorite anvil stone. Mongooses are sometimes caught and eaten by crocodiles, but like many of the small creatures along the river, they've learned to live with danger. A large croc will catch and eat almost anything, from a frog to a one-ton buffalo. It will scavenge, too. A fish eagle returns to feed on a catfish it caught earlier, but was unable to carry away. For most of the year, the Grumetti River crocs make do with such slim pickings. But then, one cold morning in the dry season, something happens that changes their lives and makes this population unique. There is a rumbling in the distance that the older crocs recognize and respond to. The wildebeest are coming. There are over a million wildebeest on the Serengeti, and every year their migration in search of grass and water brings them to Grometi and to these pools. a small percentage of the population comes down to the crocodile pools. The chance that any of them have drunk here before is small, so they are unaware of the danger. The calves are only six months old, 
so they have never seen a crocodile in their lives. Even when a sandbank forces the croc to expose its back, the wildebeest do not recognize the threat. Baboons generally bark a warning when they spot a predator, so they make good watchdogs for the herd. They are frightened of crocs, as their behavior when drinking or crossing the river shows. But they have lived alongside these dragons all their lives, so unless they feel threatened, they remain calm. Their relaxed behavior helps to reassure the herd. But even without crocodiles, drinking is always a dangerous time. The wildebeest are braced for flight, so the crocs miss many more than they catch. weighs over a ton. The wildebeest, 300 pounds. There can be only one outcome. Crocodile's jaws are designed like a steel trap, with teeth like spikes to hold prey. It does not have specialized teeth like other carnivores for cutting meat and shearing bones, or even jaws capable of chewing action. Some Africans call it the animal that kills while it's smiling. With a large carcass, several crocs simply grab hold of the animal and use their huge bulk and strength to twist a piece off. An adult wildebeest comes apart like a rag doll. Cooperating in this way to break up a carcass and share the meat shows a high degree of social organization and is very unusual among reptiles. The wildebeest drink at these pools for only a week or two, but in that time, the crocs become completely engorged. 
The metabolism of a large crocodile is so slow that like a python that has swallowed a goat, it will not need to eat again for many months. In fact, some of the largest crocs may not eat anything substantial until the migratory herds return. On this little river, the annual wildebeest feast sustains a population of crocodiles that is probably the largest and most exciting in Africa. The dry season tightens its grip. The water stops flowing. And marabou storks and pelicans come to harvest the dwindling pools. Soon there will be nothing, even for the birds. And they will move on. The Grumeti flows west through the Serengeti National Park and joins the waters of Lake Victoria. This is Africa's largest lake, and it in turn empties into Africa's longest river, the Nile. Then in northern Uganda, most of this mighty flow is suddenly squeezed through a 27-foot gap, the Murchison Falls. These falls hold no records for height or volume, but for sheer violence, there is nothing quite like them. Downstream, where the river spreads itself out again, the dragons are nesting. On the same beaches they use every year, the females dig down a couple of feet and lay up to 80 eggs, each about the size of an elongated tennis ball. They are incubated by the heat of the sun, but the females lie on top of the nests to protect them from predators. This makes the beach a safer place for other would-be egg layers as well. The soft-shell turtle would like to lay her eggs on the heavily guarded beach. The trick is getting past the guards. This may look like a dangerous encounter for the turtle, but her shell works as a shield. This time, she is let off. She'll return, though. The benefits of nesting on a protected beach are worth the risks. Weavers, too, find it worthwhile. Though their tightly woven nests are safe from most predators, they are vulnerable to snakes and monitor lizards that the crocs will chase away. But, like any accommodation with tight security, the rent comes high. Any tenant that does not take reasonable precautions may end up paying in full for the benefit of the colony. On a per-head basis, it's not a bad deal for such a lethal watchdog.
The water thick knee, or dickup, has forged an uneasy alliance with the crocodile. Moving slowly and keeping a low profile, she may lay her eggs within a couple of feet of her scaly sentinel. The turtle, the weaver, and the dickup are all seeking protection. And this is what they fear. The monitor lizard is a pint-sized dragon that grows to about five feet. Alert and efficient predators, their favorite food is eggs. Anybody's eggs. On another beach, where there are no crocodiles, spur-winged plovers are nesting. The birds will put up a brave defense. But without the fear of crocodiles to deter it, the lizard can make a leisurely search. Back on the crocodile beach, the dickup creeps past its giant defender. Here, the dangers of nesting in such sinister company are outweighed by the advantages. The main benefit seems to be that any monitor that visits the beach is apprehensive and jumpy. The dickup's aggressive display, though less forceful than the plovers, will be enough to send the already nervous lizard scuttling. For 90 days, this beach has been a safer place for several species, thanks to the guardian female crocodiles. Their concern, of course, has been solely for their own eggs, and now their devotion is rewarded. Suddenly, one evening, the nest beaches begin to sing. Below the sand, inside the eggs, the young crocodiles are signaling that they are ready to break free. The females now have an exhausting task. They must dig down to open up the nest so the eggs can hatch. So daunting is the challenge that come nightfall, they will have barely made headway. At dawn, a female comes ashore to finish digging out her young. The calling of the hatchlings attracts monitor lizards too, and they become bolder in their raids on the beach. This one has found a turtle's nest out on the edge of the beach. The eggs, each about the size of a billiard ball, seem custom-made for consumption. Several nests may hatch at the same time, but the females have no problem recognizing their own. The young crocodiles cannot break free until the nest is opened up. 
And sometimes the female must dig down two feet or more, something she is not well adapted to doing. Driven on by the chirruping of her young, she finally exposes the eggs. Many hatch explosively, almost as soon as they are uncovered. The event brings about a complete transformation in the female croc. From a monstrous killing machine, she becomes a caring and infinitely gentle creature. Her priority now is to get her young safely to the water, and the safest place on the beach is inside her fearsome mouth. Its floor drops to form a pouch to carry them. The hatchlings beg to be picked up, but she also picks up the unhatched eggs and with great precision squeezes them just enough to crack them open. Those teeth can shred a buffalo, and the pressure exerted by that bite can be enormous. But there are also sensors at the base of each tooth. And when she wants to, she can use her jaws as delicately as forceps. The monitor lizards know their chance will come, because when she has about 20 young in her pouch, the female must take them down to the river, leaving the nest unguarded. Finding a shallow place out of the current and with weeds for her young to hide in, she gently shakes her jaws to wash out the eggshells and hatchlings. It is a dangerous new world for these babies, but the female cannot spend any time settling them in. For back on the beach, the dangers are even greater. With the female away, the lizards move in to play out one of the oldest continuing dramas on this earth. A large female lays up to 80 eggs a year and may breed for 50 years. In a stable population, only a few of those thousands of eggs need to reach maturity. So every year, the nesting crocodiles provide this great feast for the small creatures that share the river with them. No other predator passes energy down the food chain in this generous fashion. Yeah. 
Back in the water, the scent of the eggshells has attracted fish, which come to tear out the membranes. The tiny crocs are in danger here too, and must hide among the reeds. In the open water, there are Nile perch, each weighing up to a hundred pounds, as alert and voracious as any monitor lizard. The Dickup's egg has hatched, and now that the monitors are bolder, both adults are kept busy holding them at bay. This time, when the croc charges ashore, she passes close to the Dickup family. The chick freezes, and the female throws herself into a different display. This is not the aggressive show that frightened off the lizards. This time, she is feigning an injury, flopping helplessly in front of the croc, trying to lure it away from her chick. It works. The croc is fooled and lumbers after her. In the confusion, the croc's attention is switched to a monitor lizard. It goes for him instead. And for the Dickups, the moment of danger has passed. But not yet for the baby crocs. The mother must make four or five trips to the river with her mouth full of hatchlings. And until she has moved them all to safety, the raiding will continue. Despite all the female's efforts, on many beaches, monitors and other predators wipe out over half the eggs and young. When this tender behavior was first observed, it was thought that the babies were being eaten. Male crocs especially were said to devour their offspring. In fact, it is extremely rare for them to prey on their newly hatched young, and the male is usually as protective and gentle with the offspring as the female. But on this beach, that extremely rare and terrible thing is happening. This male is not gently taking the hatchlings into his mouth. This male is a cannibal. Whether he is the father of these young or a stranger, he is intimidating to the female. When she tries to return to her nest, he uses his superior size to drive her off. He threatens her, and she adopts a submissive posture. She moves off, leaving him to return to his gruesome meal.
Now is the time, too, for the soft-shell turtles to hatch. Unlike the crocodiles, these young break out of their eggs on their own and dig their way to the surface unaided. They even scuttle to the water without any protective cover from an adult. Their mothers did provide some protection. They laid their eggs on a crocodile beach, where they had the benefit of those heavyweight guards. But are the guards to be trusted? Other creatures here have had to pay dearly for protection. Now is it the hatchling's turn? After 200 million years of coexistence with the crocs, the turtles have nothing to worry about. There's an old saying in the army, if it moves, salute it. If it doesn't, paint it. On this beachhead, the command is usually, if it moves, eat it. But while she is nesting, a female rarely eats. So the turtles proceed unharmed. And if something small and helpless happens to cross her path during this tender time, the command seems to be, if it moves, mother it. The female picks up a hatchling and takes it into her gently smiling jaws. The attacks the turtle's mother suffered to lay her eggs near the crocodiles have paid off. Her young get a relatively safe passage across the beach. And one of them even gets carried down to the water. The glut of eggs the crocodiles provide each year is shared by any number of creatures. The marsh mongoose makes a quick visit to grab one while the female is taking a mouthful of young to the river. Birds come to eat the eggshells, to get the calcium they need for their own eggs. African pied wagtails. Striped swallows. And long-tailed starlings. Baboons come as well. And like any humans on a beach picnic, they fret about getting sand on their eggs. The gray-headed kingfisher uses the old crocodile nest as a start for its own excavations. Diving beak first at the small bank the crocs have provided, the kingfishers make a start on a hole that will eventually be a couple of feet deep. And so, long after the crocs have finished nesting, there will still be eggs hatching on these bustling beaches. For their first few days, the 10-inch hatchlings live off their yolk sacs, 
and stick together close to the place they first swam out of their mother's jaws. The female is still constantly on guard. She defends her stretch of shoreline against intruding crocs. Still, most of her young gradually fall prey to predators, both in and out of the water. 90% will die in the first year. Protecting the offspring is an unrelenting task for the mother, one that she will face for several months all on her own. But if no man is an island, the same cannot be said of a crocodile. For their first couple of months, the young find a perfect refuge atop their mother. They all gather on her back as soon as she is available for basking, giving a whole new meaning to the idea of babysitting. The babies, with their very thin skins, are tormented by tsetse flies, but in a way they owe their existence to these pests. Tsetses are the carriers of sleeping sickness, and this part of the Nile was made into a national park only because this disease had depopulated the area and made it uninhabitable for humans. Back on the Grometi River, the year has come full circle. The pools are shrinking, and thousands of small catfish, called squeakers, come to the surface to gulp air. The wood stork catches them with ease. And even small crocs are tempted to take advantage of the weakened fish. In their first year, crocs mainly eat insects. Later, they move up to tadpoles, frogs, and fish. This one is trying to move up a little too fast. A dragon and a dragonfly. The youngsters keep away from the adults now and gather in these mixed age groups. They grow about a foot a year at first, slowing down as they get older. It will be 10 or 15 years before they are ready to tackle a wildebeest.
They come down to the pools as they do every year, thirsty innocents glancing without much interest at the strange shapes floating in the water. And as always, there is a week or two of primeval carnage until the crocs are full. Then, there is a strange and spooky truce. Like human diners contemplating the dessert tray, the crocodiles cannot resist looking, but neither can they eat another thing. Only if one is accidentally stepped on is there any action. There can be only one outcome. Or can there? The croc really isn't hungry. And he does, after all, have complete control over those massive jaws. The animal that kills while smiling can, it seems, also laughingly let go. Incredibly, the wildebeest walks away, unworried and unmarked. Every year, the great herds that thunder across the Serengeti come to these pools on the Grometi and sacrifice a few dozen lives so that the rest may drink. For the wildebeest, this rendezvous is a small episode on a long trek. For the crocodiles, it is crucial. These 16-footers are among the largest and heaviest crocs in Africa. A few could live along the Grometi on a diet of catfish, but not this collection of monsters. Just as many of the small creatures along the river rely on the annual banquet of crocodile eggs, this unique population of crocs relies on the yearly feast provided by the migrating herds. They thrive only because of the wildebeest. Africa is speckled with great lakes and laced with wide rivers. A puny stream that a baboon can jump over in the dry season, the Grumeti is the last place you would expect to find such a spectacular show put on by the world's most dramatic reptiles. Today there are no more blank spaces on the map, but even as satellites chart our planet with impressive accuracy, over this little corner of the Serengeti could still be written, here, the dragons.
in the pages of National Geographic magazine. For only $24 a year, all the wonders of our world unfold before you in breathtaking photographs and stories. No other magazine captures life in such dazzling color. Join the society and you'll enjoy award-winning photographs that celebrate life's wonders. And open your eyes to the remarkable diversity of our world. Whether you're trekking across Africa or racing to adventure, National Geographic magazine takes you far beyond ordinary reporting for extraordinary behind-the-scenes stories, stories you won't find anywhere else. Throughout the year, you'll also receive up to six valuable reference maps that chart yesterday's world and today's with uncompromising accuracy. As a society member, you'll help support important scientific research, like Jane Goodall's 30-year study of chimpanzees. National Geographic magazine, award-winning photographs you'll never forget, captivating articles that take you along each step of the way, and outstanding maps that expand your knowledge of the world. National Geographic promises you the best and nothing less.